Good morning. It is Wednesday, September 16th, 2020, and I'm Pastor Mark Dilley of West Valley Grace Fellowship. I pray that the message today will be used to strengthen you in your faith and encourage you with your walk with our Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been talking about the eternal state, which begins with the rapture of the church, which also at that time when we will be given our new bodies, which are from heaven. And it is the very purpose for which God created us in the church, the body of Christ, was to this end, to be given this new body and to be with him forever. So as members of the church, the body of Christ, we hold a very exalted position in the spiritual realm. The spiritual and physical state for all who have believed the gospel of salvation for today will be a glorious existence in a perfect environment of love, joy, and peace. Our personal spiritual state at one time was to be dead in trespasses and sins and objects of wrath. But now by the grace of God, we've been made alive in Christ and have been given this guaranteed future through faith in his blood that was shed for our sins, knowing that he died in our place. Let's begin with looking at Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 4. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. And that word disobedient isn't talking so much about their behavior as it is talking about their disobedience by not believing the gospel of salvation for today. And then it goes on to say in verse 3, Ephesians 2 and verse 3, all of us, saved or unsaved, all of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. When he says like the rest, he's talking about the unsaved. Now both us when we were unsaved and the unsaved today were objects of wrath. The only way to escape that position is to trust Jesus Christ, believing he bore your sins in his body on that cross. When we were in that state, we were condemned. How thankful we are for the truth of Romans <clears throat> chapter 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And so that is the key. It is by faith that you are saved. It is by grace that you are saved. It's not by obedience to certain behaviors or rituals that you get saved or that you are kept saved. We are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. And at that time, let's look at verse 5. Now by the grace of God and through personal faith in the cross work of Christ, we have been saved. Ephesians 2, 5. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And so what that's saying is we were living in this state of sin. We were dead 
in sin. And God, in pure grace, made us alive in Christ by faith. And then going on to verse 6. And hath raised us up together. And that's an aorist active verb. Every believer in Jesus Christ, having trusted Christ, has been raised up in the spiritual realm and seated or made us sit together with him in the heavenlies in Christ. That in the ages to come, you hear that? In the ages to come, not just the age to come, there are going to be multiple, multiple ages yet in eternity. And in those ages to come, he might show his, the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. And so I think that's talking more than just about the fact that in this present evil world we're living in, we stand in grace today. And so we're overwhelmed with thanksgiving for the grace of God that keeps us moment by moment, day by day, year after year. But he's going to continue that throughout eternity. And I'm of the opinion that this verse is talking about the exceeding riches of his grace as we continue our existence with Christ in heaven for eternity. And we were not just eternally united to Christ through faith, but we have been spiritually resurrected and made to sit with him in heavenly places. And I'm of the opinion here that that's talking not so much about the physical reality, because we're here on earth right now, but we have already been raised up and we are seated with him in a position, I believe, of authority. <clears throat> Let's look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18 through 21. 18 through 21. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. First of all, the hope to which he has called us is this hope we're talking about to be with him eternally in heaven. And to have this relationship, which I believe is, as far as the revelation of Scripture, other than the Godhead, we are the next tier of authority as members of the church, the body of Christ. And as God has delegated authority and reign here on earth in the eternal state to his Son and to Israel, well, in the heavenlies, it will be his son and the church, the body of Christ. And so this passage may give us some insight into what I'm talking about in the authority. The same word, the same phrase is used in Romans 9, 17, when the Lord say, or the scriptures say about Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose. God had put Pharaoh in the leadership position, the most powerful person here on earth. That's where he was seated in his government role. And now we as members of the church, the body of Christ, are seated with Christ in the heavenly role. And so it says, I raised you up for this very purpose that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. That was God's purpose for Pharaoh. But God has a purpose, I believe, for the resurrected, exalted church, the glorified church in heaven, a position of authority. And so let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 
verses 2 and 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2. Do you not know the saints shall judge the world? That word saint means separated one or holy ones. And that's what we are as members of the church, the body of Christ. Paul's letters are written to the saints. You and I today as members of the church, the body of Christ, are saints. And we shall judge the world. And then he goes on to say, if we're going to judge the world, shall, if the, and if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Paul was talking to the Corinthian church and going to court over worldly concerns with believers against believers. And he said that shouldn't be the case. The church, the body of Christ, should have the insight, the spiritual power to judge these matters. And so he goes on to say in verse 3, Know ye not <clears throat> that we shall judge angels? Now there I believe it means that we shall rule over the spiritual realm as members of the church, the body of Christ. And we will judge over the angels. I don't believe it's talking about us judging the fallen angels. God has already judged them. They just haven't been sentenced. And so, if we are going to judge the world, if we're going to judge angels, Paul concludes with, how much more things that pertain to this life. And so, in the church, there should be no division, there should be no lawsuits or anything like that. The true church, the body of Christ, should be able to settle their problems. It does declare that the members of the church, the body of Christ, will be given also very significant spiritual blessings, being heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Romans 8.16 The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if, or and since, we are children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. And so again, every member of the church, the body of Christ, will be glorified. They already are glorified in God's position. God has called us. He sanctified us. He justified us. He glorified us in Christ. It's already done. And so, having been sealed under the day of redemption, we can rest in Christ and rejoice in the future that is laid up for us in heaven. This is part of what I think Paul had complete assurance in when he had said that he had found the secret, that he was now able to be content in every circumstance because he wasn't focused on his earthly needs and existence. He had set his affections on things above and that's where his focus was. And I believe that's the key for every member of the church, the body of Christ, is to set your affection on things above and not on the things of this earth. And that's where that peace and joy and love and grace will all start to flourish in your life. This is all in accordance with God's purpose and will to the praise of his glorious grace. That's what the gospel of the grace of God is all about. The church, the body of Christ, and its eternal glorious future with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. And so verse 7 of uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7. That in the ages to come, 
he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. It is my faith that the church, the body of Christ, will be an eternal manifestation and continual recipient of the grace and the riches of the grace of God throughout eternity. And now these things, they're all directly from one, just one passage in Paul's writings, but these things really take on their full meaning when you rightly divide the word of truth. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this glorious revelation concerning the church, the body of Christ, and its future eternal state in heaven with you. And we give you all the praise and the thanks forever and ever. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.